Well, guys, we're kicking off a new series today. And here's the odd thing about this new series. I don't have a title for it. So I'm going to put you on task, okay? Uh, so first service, some people came up with some pretty interesting titles. We got misconceptions. Somebody said, the Bible says what? <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know how to write that. But anyways, that was the gist of it. So we're going to be in this series. And I'm going to give you... That go ahead to after service, you can come up to me or one of the team and say, hey, I got an idea. Okay, and you're going to help us name this next series. So this is what it's going to be about, is we're going to be talking about over the next three to four weeks in this series, we're going to tackle scriptures that are found in the Bible, but that are often twisted, misunderstood, or misused. Have you ever ran into some of those where somebody misquotes a scripture and they kind of twist it and use it for their own benefit? Well, hey, we're going to tackle these common verses that people use that maybe they're twisting them, misusing them. It's not really a place of judgment. It's just like, hey, let's figure out what does the Bible really say? What is God really trying to communicate? Okay, so if you can come up with a cool title, let us know. So here's the verse that we're going to tackle today in this message that I've titled, Don't Judge Me, okay? Don't judge me. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 and 2, and it says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. How many of you have ever heard that verse? Anybody? Yes, there's hands all over the place. How many of you have ever used that verse? Isn't it interesting when it comes to this verse? People don't just say it like, hey, listen, don't judge or else you'll be judged too. Most of the time it comes out with some attitude like, hey, don't judge me. Come on, like what gives you the right to speak into my life and think that you know what you're talking about? Don't judge me. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I've always heard that with a little bit of, like I like to call this, there's some stank on it, okay? They put some stanky attitude on this do not judge. And it says this, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the text that we're going to tackle today. And this is, you know, this couple verses. And we want to understand what is it that God is really trying to, you know, communicate. This is one that I see that believers and even non-believers know this verse, right? And they use it. And so I want to know, are we using it correctly? I mean, is, if we took this at face value, do not judge or you will be judged. If I took that at face value, is it ever okay to call something wrong? Is it ever okay to call something right? Or do I just need to just leave it up to anybody's discretion and their ideas? And see, I'm going to argue that this is one of the most pervasive values in American culture today is that we say this, let's just tolerate every kind of thing. Let's just tolerate every belief system, every idea and every behavior. You have no right to say something is right or wrong. And if you do, you're judging. So therefore, you will be judged. And that's how people use it. And I see it often, you know, where people use this passage and really they're using it as a defense mechanism or a hammer to bang you over the head with to say, you know what? I want to live my life the way that I want to live. I don't care if it's right according to the Bible or not. I don't care if it's, if it's right according to scripture and God's plan for my life. I want to do what I want to do. And I don't want you to tell me that I'm wrong. I don't want you to come here with your opinions. I don't want you to come here with your slander and making me upset and making me feel bad about myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw up the wall. I'm going to bang you over the head with this scripture. Don't judge me. How dare you judge me? How dare you think that you know anything about my life? How dare you try to control me and tell me what is right and what is wrong? How many of you have encountered that? And here's the craziest thing, and I believe this is one of the most twisted parts of the whole thing, is that we have a culture that values the ability to pursue a lifestyle that opposes God and then use the word of God to justify a lifestyle that is in direct opposition to him. Isn't that a, tr a twisted way of thinking? So it's like, I don't even believe in this, God. I don't even really believe in the Bible, but I'm going to take this thing right here and I'm going to use it to beat you over the head with it so then that way you don't confront me. Isn't that a wild thing to think? But that's part of our society. And so when it comes to judging, we see that people become very hyper-defensive these days and they don't take any kind of disagreement or any, any kind of correction and so what I want to do today is I really want to look at judging. Like, what does this really mean? And what is God trying to say? And why is this so important? Because judging 
and being judged are harsh things. It's hard to be judged. It's hard to be criticized. You know, often people judge out of misunderstandings. You know, I was uh, watching this video recently where there was a, there were two guys, two young guys, good looking dudes, you know, tall, strong, young guys. And they're in this big like monster truck and they're following this young girl. She's really pretty and and they're, they're, they're driving behind her and they're honking their horn at her. Well, finally, she just has enough. She's like, I'm tired of being you know, pestered and harassed by these guys. So she stops her car right in the middle of the road and she gets out and she just starts cussing them out. She walks up to the window, bangs on the window, leave me alone, knock this off, man. You're not gonna harass me. And the guy like rolls the window down. He says, hey, I'm not trying to harass you. I'm just trying to let you know that you drove off in the gas pump, the hose that's hanging out of your gas tank. And think about that, that they were misjudged, right? Their, their, their intentions were being misjudged by this young lady. And obviously she was mortified and like, oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing. And yeah, she was kind of prideful. She didn't even say thank you. She just walks away and gets and still drives off with the hose hanging out, you know. But when we get judged often, you know, it is through a misunderstanding and that hurts. And so I want to talk about this today. I want to, you know, okay, well, Is there ever a time when it's okay to tell somebody that they're wrong? Is it okay to actually have a standard and let somebody know that you don't agree with their choices? Is it okay? I mean, because if you take this verse at face value, it kind of looks like if you judge somebody, if you say that it's right or it's wrong, like you're heaping judgment on yourself. You know, and, you know, we might ask the question, you know, what, what about a teacher or professor? Do they have the right to judge an essay correctly? You know, what if it's negative? Or what if you leave a, a, a rating less than five stars on Yelp for a restaurant? Are you being judgmental? So then are you therefore bringing judgment on your own business or on your own finances? Because, you know, like we, these are tough questions. There's things like if you follow the logic of the way that the world translates this, that don't tell me anything, don't tell me that I'm wrong, don't question me, don't correct me. If we follow that line of thinking, where do we end up being? Would it be unfair to judge a judge and a jury who sentence a child predator, but he says that he is genuinely attracted to 10-year-old children? Would we, would we be wrong to say that that's wrong? And it, I think it even takes it to another level. If I asked you, well, what if that 10-year-old was your 10-year-old? Would that change the way you think about it? You know, even our own governor in our state, I found, you know, just this last week, he was lowering the sentences for sex offenders, you know, child sex offenders, And I think that a lot of it is based on this logic right here is where they're saying, you know, well, don't judge. Just let people live the way that they want to live. They're adults and they can make their own choices. And so this kind of leads us to an interesting place. It leads us to an interesting place. And today I want to tackle this. Do we ever have the right to call somebody out to say that something is wrong? And I want to tackle this through scripture. But as we do this over the next three to four weeks, I want to give you three things that we're going to do when we look at Scripture. And this is something that you should do on a day-to-day basis anyways as you're studying the Word. And I'm going to give you three things. These are going to be our guidelines, okay? As one is that we are going to seek to understand the context, okay? So we're not going to take a verse out of context. We're going to seek to know the, the setting, the history. We want to know who it's being said to, why it's being said, when it was being said. So we want to see the context of it, but we also want to interpret Scripture with Scripture, okay? That there's continuity in the Bible, okay? That there, you can know God's nature. You can know His attributes. You can know His will for your life through His Word. And so as you seek to you know, build a foundation of understanding in the word of God, you've got to let scripture interpret scripture, that you don't just pull one verse and build theology on this one idea, okay? Is it consistent with what God is saying? And can you find it in other places? And then lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to look for the application, okay? And I like to say it this way, is the Bible is not only a text to be studied, but it's a letter to be lived, Let me say it again, that the Bible is not only a text to be studied, but it is a letter from God to you and I to be lived out. So we're going to look at this, understand the context, interpret Scripture with Scripture, and look for the application. And that's what we're going to do today with our verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Are you guys ready to dive into this? Okay, awesome. All right, well, what we see is... Let me just ask you a real simple question. Not a trick question. What comes before Matthew chapter 7? Chapter 6. All right, got a genius up here on the front. I'm thankful you're here. 
Wasn't a trick question, okay? So Matthew chapter 6. So we're going to get some context on this verse, okay? Who's he talking to and what's actually going on here? That is this just some weird, you know, verse that just fell out of the sky, burnt, and found its way into this? Well, what you have to understand is that when the Bible was written, you know, it, there's chapters and verses that are applied which allow us to get to certain places quickly, okay? It's like numbers on a page. Turn to page number 50. Well, that helps you get there and be able to grab that content. Well, this right here in those days when this was Jesus preaching. So there were no chapters, there were no verses, there were no pages to turn to. So what we find is that there's a common theme between chapter six and chapter seven. We're going to follow the flow. What is God actually saying contextually here? So when we go back to chapter six, we find in verse two, verse five, and I believe it's verse 16, we find that Jesus is railing on the Pharisees. He's giving them the old one, two, you know, the two piece and a biscuit, man. He's going at them. And what, what, he's, what he's accusing them and not and rightly accusing them of is he's saying, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You guys are judging people and you guys are putting all this pressure on people to live in a manner that you are not even living up to. You're setting this bar so high, but you're not even living up to that bar. So Jesus is challenging them because he's saying, you guys, you're putting so much weight on these people. You're crushing them under the weight of religion. And so Jesus is confronting them. And so what he's saying in chapter seven, so really the theme is hypocrisy. It's not even really about judgment. And then Jesus continues with this thought as we start the next chapter. He tells the Pharisees, he's saying, do not judge or you too will be judged. And then he continues this thought with the Pharisees. If we can go to verse three. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? And he says this, man, he's getting real. He says, you hypocrite. He says, first, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what we see contextually here is that this verse about judge not lest you be judged, if we're going to go back to the King James Version, or judge not or you will be judged. What we see is that it really has little to do with judging. It has everything to do with hypocrisy. Because see, as we see here in context, Jesus is saying, you will see clearly. So he says, first, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's saying, hey, listen, it's okay to point out things in your brother's eye. But what he's saying is don't go over there and point out little things in other people when you got major issues. What he's saying is you got some big stuff going on. You got some big problems in your own life. And here you are. You want to go over there to your brother and start picking on him. Uh oh. All right. Here we go again. It's coming up. Speak, Lord. Yes. I'm telling you, man, every week I've been getting that and uh, the joys of doing church in a movie theater. All right, cool. <laughs> Grand entrance. I wish that would happen at the beginning of service, but give me more confidence to preach. But anyways, <laughs> but what we see in this passage is that he's saying is, listen, you Pharisees, you've got some big stuff going on. You've got some evil things going on in your hearts. And what you want to do is you want to pick and nitpick at people's little stuff. He's saying, deal with your own issues first before you go to them. That's all he's really saying. And so when we look at this in context, we begin to see that a different picture is being painted. We're not being told that we can't judge people. We're not being told that we can't call things wrong that are wrong and things that are right, right. That it is okay to determine what a man and a woman is culturally, right? It's like, well, if you, I mean, it made me so sad. I was watching a video the other day and it's like, they're interviewing these young people and they're saying, what's a woman? And they know what a woman is, but they can't say it for fear of being ridiculed. So they're like, oh, well, uh, um, uh, uh. and we're just, we got a society that is gripped because they are living by this verse and they've been abused with this verse. Judge not lest you be judged. And so what it's doing is it's dumbing down our culture and it's silencing people that should be speaking out. 
because you know inside what the truth is, and most people do. And it's just sad how people have been barraged culturally with this verse, banged over the head like it's a sledgehammer. But when you realize that the verse in context, when we see it for what it really is, it's not talking about judging people. It's talking about not judging people with a hypocritical heart. Are you guys seeing this today? So what I want to do is I want to see Scripture. I want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So what does Scripture actually have to say about judgment? Can like, we get a clear picture of what Jesus really wants us to understand through his words? And the first thing that I want you to see today is that we never judge superficially. Okay, so if you're going to judge somebody, you're, you never judge superficially. Listen to what it says in John chapter 7, verse 24. These are Jesus' own words. So if you had a paper Bible right now, this would be, and it was red letter edition, these words would be in red letters. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says this. He says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So do you see that? He didn't say don't judge. What he's saying is that you must judge correctly. And how do you judge wrongly? is when you do it by mere appearances. That when we judge people superficially, it leads us down a path of judging incorrectly. And the the interesting part about this is that you can actually be on the right side and the wrong side of a specific issue if you're not judging correctly. You know, one time... Um, when I first started in heating and air conditioning, this was back in 1995. Some of you in this room weren't even born then. And, uh, but I was, I was just a young kid. I was 19 years old. I was eager. I wanted to make some money. I wanted to build a career out of this. And so um, I was on an installation crew for a company in Riverside, California. And the service guy didn't show up to work that day. So my boss looked at me and said, hey, do you think you can go over there and at least make an appearance? You know, and I was going to go there and pretend like I knew how to service or fix an air conditioner. I barely knew anything. Well, my boss at the time, he really liked John Deere. And so instead of us having like uniforms that look like a mechanic, we looked like lawn, like landscapers. Like we had these like green, like gray pants and like a tan shirt, you know. So it was just kind of not, not really... It'd be hard to identify us as a, any kind of a mechanic or service guy, you know, look like a, a landscaper. So... I show up to this front door and this lady, she opens the door and the first words out of her mouth, she says, I don't need any landscaping today. (laughs) And I was like, well, is it because I'm Mexican or is it because I look like a landscaper? I don't know. It could have been both. So she judged me superficially. And then I said, well, actually, I'm here to fix your air conditioner. She about fell over dead. So she, you know, she was white and turned whiter, you know, it was like, she was like, oh my gosh. And so the whole time I could tell she was terribly embarrassed and apologized profusely, um, you know, multiple times. But here's the thing. So she was on the wrong side of judging superficially, but then she was kind of on the right side because she really shouldn't have let me in to fix that air conditioner because I had no clue what I was doing. I was so new. So I just went over there and tinkered around and said, oh, the service guy will be back tomorrow. <laughs> So she was on the right side and the wrong side of it because the judgment was made superficially that once I told her, she just took my word for it. And sometimes that's what happens is that you, if you judge superficially, you're going to find yourself discrediting people that are actually qualified and you're going to find yourself, you know, giving credit to people that are not qualified. Because you're only judging by the outside appearance. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's not wrong to judge. It's not wrong to call it right or wrong. But what he's saying is you got to do it correctly. And you cannot do it correctly by mere appearances. And that's the thought here. That's the thought. And so, you know, even like chasing a rabbit trail. Can I chase a rabbit trail? Anybody want to go on a ride with me? You know, one of the things that I believe grieves the heart of God, especially when it comes to this, we see it a lot in the Christian world. Like, I, you, know, I, I, you know, as a pastor, I, I try to consume a lot of content and trying to learn and, and grow. And even sometimes, on, you know, I'll go on YouTube and I see that some people have really made a career out of bashing the church, bashing other pastors. You know, they have their own channels and they've created a brand on being the only ones with the truth, you know, the only ones with the truth. And they're taking clips, you know, of a a pastor preaching from a 45 minute, you know, sermon. You know, they're taking about four or five seconds and saying, oh, look at this guy's a heretic. Listen, he's, you know, he could have just been telling a story of what somebody once said, using it as a thought. And, but they grab that one little clip and then they make a meme out of it and they make, you know, a reel out of it and this thing goes viral. And the next thing you know, this guy's being obliterated and attacked because of mere appearances. 
You know, even the song that we sing, the second song today, Reckless Love, you know, that, that's, you know, we considered, you know, not singing that song at Hub City Church just because of the backlash that so many people had against that song. Well, God's love is not reckless. God's love is intentional. But if you see the heartbeat of the song, it's like God was reckless in the way that he didn't hold back. He gave us all. He sent his son. He gave us his best when we deserved his worst. We see that God, you know, he went after us. He chased us, the one. He left the 99. Are you guys seeing that? And so then somebody could come to the church and go, oh, well, they were singing that song, man. You know, they're one of those, you know, churches, you know, their pastor's a heretic. And I bet, you know, he's just in it for the money. But those of you that know me, you know that I have a, a desperate passion and love for Jesus. That I've sacrificed, Veronica and I have sacrificed our lives for the cause of God's kingdom. And we love people w- without withholding our love from people. We love unconditionally the best we know how is just being, you know, just real people. So if you were going to judge the, the church from the outside, you could walk in. Somebody one day judged us and left the church here because our worship uh, team were wearing shoes. And so our hearts were judged and the cause and the mission of this church was judged off of something that was superficial. It was something that was just simply a mere appearance. And so I want to challenge you that if you are going to judge correctly, you have to ask God to show you how he sees the people that you are being tempted to judge. And I'll tell you, it'll change your heart. It'll change everything. And I just want to say this, you know, as Hub City, I feel like I need to say this as a pastor that as a church, that we will always be for people that are for God. Because nobody's perfect. No pastor says all the right things all the time. No worship team writes the most perfect song. Nobody leads perfectly. Nobody is perfectly. But I'm going to tell you this, or is perfect. But I'm going to tell you this, that if somebody is for God, we're going to be for them. We're going to choose to believe the best in them and trust that from my vantage point, I'm only merely judging them superficially. I don't know their heart. God knows their heart. And we know according to scripture that in the end, God will separate the goats from the sheep. We know that God will separate the wheat from the tares. He's going to work it out. So does that mean that I don't have a standard? If I hear heresy, if I hear unbiblical teaching, unsound teaching, I'm just going to receive it? Of course I'm not. But if I don't know somebody, I'm not going to judge their life and call them a heretic and beat up on them and say harsh things and go on my own YouTube channel. And this is why you shouldn't play this song. And this is why you should never go here. And this is why you should never go there. I believe that grieves the heart of God because God could be dealing with them in that moment. And often when we believe that we've got it all worked out, here's the here's the craziest thought is that if God is for something that you oppose because it's your own opinion, and you begin to oppose those things. Think about this. And this is what brings us to a place of humility. You could very well be opposing God. Isn't that a crazy thought? And some of us never slow down to think that. That's why before we judge, we say, you know what, God? This seems off. And you know what I do is I just don't participate in it. I don't listen to that person. I don't promote that person. If I don't like that song, then I don't listen to that song. But I'm not going to judge it on mere appearances. Are we good on that? I hope I'm being clear. Number two is that we never, we never judge hypocritically. We never judge hypocritically. So Paul is writing to the church of Rome, and this is what he has to say in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 1. He says, You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. He says, When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. Man, he's going in on them. And he says, for you who judge others do the very same things. He's saying, listen, man, you're going in on these people, man. You're blasting them. You're trying to undercut their reputation. You're trying to call them out. And what Paul is saying, hey, you you need to slow your roll, man, because you know what? I've looked at your life and you're doing the same exact thing that you're accusing them of. And then he continues in in verse 4. And this is what I love because Paul brought really the revelation of grace. And he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? He says, does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So I love how Paul shifts it. He said, instead of focusing on what they're doing wrong, he said, why don't we focus on how great Jesus is? 
Instead of focusing on how that church and this pastor and that leader and this person at work and this neighbor, and you're so focused on what everybody's doing wrong, he says, why don't we just focus on how good God has been to us? And that postures and, and repostures and positions your heart really to a place of humility and focusing and saying, you know what, man, if I was left to myself, man, I'd be a dirt ball, man. I'd be a slime ball here. I'd have a lot to be judged for. But thank God for his kindness. Thank God for him being tolerant with me. Thank God for him being patient with me. Thank God for him showing his kindness, which is leading me back to, the, to him continually. And you just see that often what we do is that we do judge people hypocritically. We have one standard for them. and We have one standard for ourselves. And who are we behaving like? the very people that Jesus was jamming up in Matthew 6, the Pharisees. And he's saying, listen, don't judge them hypocritically. You know, I love what Craig, Craig Rochelle says. He's a pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma. And he says this, he says, the place you issue your harshest judgment often reveals your deepest weakness. Let me say that again for those in the back. The place you issue your harshest judgment often reveals your deepest weakness. I've seen this happen, guys. I've seen this happen so often where people begin to judge somebody else in a specific area and they come down harshly on them. But I happen to believe that often it's a little bit of self-hatred on the inside because they know it's the very thing. If they were to take a moment to look in the mirror, the thing that they're going in on everybody else about, actually it's because they're feeling bad about it because it's part of what's going on inside that you don't know. I remember as a young kid watching this pastor and he was on TV and man, he was just harsh. He's going in on, on people that were singing Christian heavy metal music. And he's like, these guys are of the devil, man. These long haired guys, they look like girls. And he's in his pulpit just blasting these guys. And I'm thinking, man, it takes more guts to go out and talk about Jesus where people are drinking beer and smoking weed and out there doing violent things than it does in a church where most people believe like you believe. But he's judging them and he's bashing and thrashing these people and saying that they're of the devil. And then he started in on all these people that were lustful and pouring on you know, graphic magazines. At the time, it wasn't, there was no internet. And he's like, you know, all of you, you know, disgusting men. And he's just like going at them, critically judging them. And it wasn't six months later where he's on TV bawling and squalling with tears. I have sinned before the Lord. And confessing that he himself had fallen into sexual sin, just like the people he was criticizing and judging. And I didn't say that to mock him, but it's the reality is that often people judge hypocritically. And I just believe that God is calling us to better. And what ends up happening is we begin to play this little game I like to call, we like to call it the, the, accuse and excuse accuse and excuse and what we do is we accuse other people of the sin and the things going on in their life and then we excuse it when it's in our own life it's like man you know like could you believe what they did over there could you believe and but then somebody calls you out somebody brings correction into your life and it's like well you know what I only did it one time like you know this is the very first time and you know I just happened to get caught I guess God really has a high call on my life because you know he's not going to let me get away with anything and then we start with the accuse and the excuse. And I just want to challenge you today that if that's the way you're living, that God's calling you to a different standard, that we walk in humility and we do not walk in hypocrisy. Here's the third thing that I want you to see today when we compare scripture to scripture, when it comes to judgment, is that we never hold non-Christians to Christian standards. That we never hold non-Christians to Christian standards. I want you to see what the word of God has to say in 1 Corinthians 5.12, this is Paul writing once again. He says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? He says, are you not to judge those inside? So what he's saying is, listen, you don't have a right to judge people that are outside of the family. Their family's living by different rules. But inside of our house, we are now the family of God. And we have a father and his name is, is God the Father. And he has established the rules. He's established the way that we live inside of this house. And so what he's saying is, listen, you don't try to make the people that live outside of the house live by the rules that you have established inside of your house. And so he's saying, listen, it's OK to judge. It's OK to bring correction. It's OK to sharpen each other. Those of us that are in the family. 
But think about how ludicrous that would be. You know, Veronica and I, when we were raising our two children, we had standards. There were certain movies that we watched and there were movies we didn't watch. There was certain music that was allowed in our home and there was others that wasn't tolerated. There was verbiage and words that were okay and there were some that were in the no-fly zone. But think about how weird that would be that if we had some non-believers come over and then all of a sudden we're telling them that they need to hear and live according to our rules and our house rules inside their house. And they're like, what are you talking about? And here's the hardest part of this. And I want you to get this point today. And really, if you get anything, I want you to get this. Is that we become just like the Pharisees when we start putting Christian rules on non-Christian people. They're playing for a different team. They're wearing a different uniform, folks. And this is what happens, is that when you start saying you need to behave to belong, you're in dangerous territory. Because what you're doing is you're saying, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of me. He speaks to me and tells me when I'm saying something wrong. He speaks to me and tells me when I'm doing something wrong. He empowers me to live differently. He empowers me to make wise decisions And so we have a hard enough time following God with the Holy Spirit inside of us, do we not? And then we go to somebody that doesn't have the Holy Spirit and we say, live like I live. But you do it under your own power. Talk about being unfair. And that's what the church does. So this is one of the single greatest reasons that people walk in these doors into any church and they walk right back out and say, I can't do it. Because we are becoming like the Pharisees, that we ourselves are saying, live to a standard that I can barely even live to, but you do it by yourself. And so we're not called to change them. We're called to love them and to draw them in in a loving manner to where they get introduced to the God that can change them as he's continuing to change me. Are you seeing the difference? So we don't hold them to no, hold non-Christians to Christian standards. And I'll tell you what, there'd be so many people that would be willing to give God a chance and to know him if Christians would understand that. And here's the last thing that I want you to get. Here's the application of it. Number four is that we always help restore fallen believers. We don't judge them. We don't smash them. We don't criticize them. We don't kick them when they're down. We always help restore fallen believers. Listen, every single one of us in this room, we've made some mistakes. We've done some things that we are just grateful nobody knows about. Have we not? You've looked at some stuff. You've smoked some stuff. You've drank some stuff. You've done some things that you're just grateful that you got away with it and God forgived you and you moved on. But there's some people that their failure and their fall was public. And their infidelity got called out and everybody saw it. Their divorce was public. Their DUI was public when nobody knew that they were struggling privately with alcoholism. Their shocking arrest went public. And what do we do? What do we do with believers? What do we do with brothers and sisters in Christ that fall like that? Do we judge them and condemn them? Do we kick them? Do we, you know, just be harsh to them? The Bible's very clear when it comes to having the opportunity to judge them. What do we do? Galatians chapter 6 gives us the insight. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, so it's obvious that it was wrong, right? It's a sin. Doing something wrong. You who live by the Spirit should, what? Restore that person gently. Restore them gently. It says, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Tempted with what? Tempted to do the same thing because of pride. The Bible says that pride comes before the fall. And often those that are helping restore people can be the most guilty of being judgmental because somehow, because I'm helping people, I'm at a different level. And I'm doing this. I'm just down there reaching and picking everybody up and I'm helping clean them up and I'm helping. And and we start to think that somehow we're above them. But I'm going to tell you, the only one above pulling up is Jesus. We're all people who were sinners saved by grace. 
And he says, restore that person gently. Be careful. Don't fall into the same things they're doing because you're judging them. But listen to this. It says, carry each other's burdens. And guys, the very first message I preached is almost a year ago in, in this very space right here. Is we felt that there's a mandate on Hub City to lift our city, to lift our city. But I saw a vision that when we were coming here that there were just bodies laying everywhere. People were just laid out. They were, they were tired. They were weary. Some are wounded. And there's a mandate on this church to be the people that come over and we lift our city by lifting people. And I preached a message and I said, man, we're gonna jack you up. And I brought a big old truck jack in here, man. I was like, we're gonna jack you up, man. We, we're just on the ground. We're just gonna lift you a little bit, man. And God's gonna take the rest. We're just gonna do our part. And that, that's the mandate on this church is that we're gonna lift our city. We're gonna jack some people up. We're gonna help carry their burdens where they're feeling heavy because they know that they've messed up. They know that they've made a mistake. They know that they're not living according to God's word. And they know it. And some of you, and including myself at times, you know, we take it upon ourselves to tell them stuff they already know. And how do they know it? It says the Bible says that the enemy, the devil himself, he's the accuser of the brethren. They've been accused. And so here we come as the body of Christ with more accusation when we should be coming with hope and saying, listen, I know times are hard. I know you're going through some stuff and I'm here to jack you up. <laughs> what do you mean, jack me up? Like beat me up? No, I'm gonna lift you up. And we're gonna see you through this season and we're gonna see you restored. And some of you, you've blown it royally. You've blown it royally. You've cheated, you've messed up, you've stolen, you've lied, you've manipulated. And you may even be suffering the consequences of that right now. But I want you to know that there will be a day. There will be a day if you allow God to restore you, there will be a day where you'll stand on your feet again. But as a church, our mandate is to help you get back up.